Not much has changed since I got back <laughs> no. or left. Welcome oh, back, yeah. Man. Welcome back, Matt. Thanks, guys. We got to go check you out. Uh, second to last night of the tour. So what did you it, think? It the view was out of control. The view was out of control. Yeah, we were up cool. on the balcony, somewhat behind you, shooting down on you, which was awesome. You were shooting down on me. We were trying to shoot you. That's scary. Yeah, sorry. All right, okay. We were shooting camera wise. We were shooting down on you. It was nice. That was a legit fear. The, that one somebody or two would shows, shoot you. One or two shows before that one, we played in. Yeah, it was the show before we played in Charlotte, North Carolina. Yeah, and the venue didn't have Woo! good security. Yeah, sorry, Ow. that's my Ric Flair. Yeah, there was just not there. There wasn't good security, and people were coming How many in times. You guys are. Oh, this is Ric Flair. He's doing Ric Flair. <laughs> Style and profile and oh, Matt. Man, you need a robe now. Okay. Okay. So let's take it back. So security said what? Hold on. I want to say something now <laughs> since this is happening. <laughs> Sorry. I was lucky enough to meet a lot of people that have listened to the first couple of episodes of the podcast on Very the tour. Cool. Very cool. And the biggest critique that I've been getting is talking over talking. We're all talking all over each other. <laughs> Exactly. So that was, and but let's be fair. Let's be fair. That was something that we started to address. Didi, you're doing it. We started to address that issue on the third or fourth podcast, maybe, where we try to have hand signals. I think we're all just giddy because it's been a minute since we've done a podcast, and maybe now so. we're we're very excited. Okay. So anyway, go back. So you're in Ch- Charlotte, North Carolina. Yeah. And the security said what? They didn't say anything. You weren't listening. Dun, dun, dun. No, I thought you just said there was security detail. I said there was no security. Oh, no security. I thought yeah. you said the security said. No, oh. I said that on either side of where I was positioned on stage, it was open to the outside of the venue. So anyone could just walk in because there was oh, no security right there. So throughout the set, I had it in my head that like, Someone's going to walk in and just shoot me. I don't know why I had that in my head, but like that's what I was thinking about. And it's partially because of some of the crazy tragedies that have happened like the, that. The Botaclan. The Botaclan Eagles. thing. But also, it was like a couple days after the whole Cleveland shooter. And right. I'm just thinking about, oh, well, if anybody wants to fucking get Go me. Go on Facebook Live and shoot me. Yeah, now's the perfect time. Do you think part of it is that you're super into horror movies? So things like that are more at the front of your mind? I don't think so. I mean, it's not like it was uh, consuming me by any means. You but know, it was, it was a just thought. a thought. Of course. And it's a, but it's why the next day at Silver Springs, the Fillmore, <laughs> 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 there was a security guy out back with a metal detecting kind of wand thing, whatever you call it. Right. And every single time anybody went in and out, they got checked. Well, that's it, cool. And it made me feel extremely safe and I didn't even have to think about it. And I think that's how venue should be. That may have been the dude who kind of kicked us out after the show. We were hanging by your car in the parking lot. This guy was not really having it. That's good. He made that's, us stand out of barricade, good. And, which was good. We were trying to plan something, but yeah. It, no, it was good. Job. He was doing his job for sure. Um, I remember right after the, the Bataclan, which was the venue Eagles of Death Metal was playing when the uh, shooter in Paris um, came in and killed like 90 plus people. I remember after that going to the Auto Bar, which is a great local venue in Baltimore. And they have two entrances, one from the rear and one from the front. And I remember standing in the hallway on the side of the stage where the door is then to your right to come in the front of the building. And like jokingly, which it should not even be a joke, but it, I guess you have to find levity in such a crazy situation. I'm sitting there thinking to myself, and I think I said it to Jordan and a couple other people, like, oh, this is a great spot to stand. If an if an active shooter were to walk in, we'd be the first to go because we're standing right here by the door. That's a real thought. It's a real thought. A real yeah, thought. I mean, I guess that's the reality of what we deal with these days. But, you know, you say it and then you might shrug it off and move on. Did you say it to yourself or think it and then compartmentalize it, put it away somewhere else? Did that affect your show at all? It didn't affect my show directly, no. But there was a lot of people throughout the set that were standing right to either either side of me that I didn't know who they were. Typically, when you have 
when you have a show going on, you don't really have people on stage on the side that you don't know. Right. No. You know, friends here and there, things like that. Like but tour mates. the way this venue was set up was that like the restrooms and a bunch of other stuff was like around the walkway behind the stage. Right. So there was just no one there. Anybody could have walked onto the stage at any given moment. And it, I just don't like that kind of thing. It, it's not something that I want to think about, but it is something that, as you said, it's real. We do think about those sure. things. So I just think venues now, for my preference, should have security or they should have very, very strict rules about who's allowed in certain areas. You know, D- um, Have you played venues or did you play venues on this tour? I think you've done it in other countries, but for the US tour you were just on, did you play any venues where there was no barricade with no security where people could mm-hmm. crowd surf and end up on the stage? Last night. I mean, that was one of them. Last night we played a show in uh, in Long Island and there were kids jumping on stage all night, knocking over Jeff's lighting rig. Right. That's what I was going to say because uh, fortunately you guys have a crowd that I don't think is is as crazy as some, as some other genres that would be surfing the whole entire time, end up on stage and then doing like flips onto whoever's in the front of the crowd over and over and over again. Cause normally when there's security in the front, they'll tell you to stop eventually. And we remember that from growing up. Um, but I feel like the way that your band is set up, maybe not the lighting rigs, but, um, I guess, are there pedals in the front as well? Are there other things that could be knocked into? No, there really aren't any other obstructions on stage, but it's, but still, I mean, they end up on stage, they bump into you. Something happens. It's like, it could get super out of control very fast, especially if there's no security anywhere. If they get on stage because they were crowd surfing and then they jump right back into the crowd, no problem. that kind of stuff is totally cool. Right. But if you're going to get on stage like some dickhead last night who's going to come up to me and try to like touch my cymbals while I'm playing, I don't have any patience for that yeah, whatsoever. Yeah, that's not cool. You don't do that. You're at work. Right. Yeah, I, and I would just never, I wouldn't have the audacity to do that to anyone performing like you don't touch a performer's shit while they're doing it i do want to compliment periphery fans because i've been to many hardcore shows justin and i used to play a bunch of shows where every band we played with was a hardcore band and and i've seen periphery a few times this is the first time i got to watch not only you guys but the whole crowd from a balcony and for the type of genre you guys play in the type of crowd that you attract it was very positive. Obviously, there's a lot of aggressive energy because of the type of music you play, but I saw people kind of huddled in circles, arms, you know, yeah, Justin was doing it too, getting into the action. I started that one. I was telling Matt earlier that when I, I had seen the videos, they would finish the set and there's like a, a chant sing-along portion to the end of the song that, that I think live they extended to keep it going, let the crowd keep it going. And so I felt being away from the crowd. And more recently, I I still put myself for a lot of these harder shows. I'll put myself maybe at the beginning of the, uh, like the, the, like the further back away from the stage portion of the pit so that I can have a good view, but I can also feel the energy of the people that want to move around. And I like that. Um, but I saw the circle was very far back. I knew it would get, it would be easily accessible. So I went from upstairs, downstairs, right into the middle of it and looked up where Jordan and Carly and crew were up there and uh, kind of smiled at them. But then I realized like, oh, we're at the end of the song, uh, the song Loon, and this part's going to happen. I was trying to get every single person in the pit who was kind of aimlessly meandering through the circle to get together, band together and make this like a, a big triumphant moment for the crowd. And it was cool. I think there was maybe, I don't know, 10 of us or so. Yeah. And but, even, but the people were great. They were really even, cool. Even prior to that, like, see, people fall down. Everyone goes to pick them up. Right. And I've been to plenty of other shows where people are just aimlessly throwing elbows and don't give a fuck about anyone else there. And they're more selfish about releasing their own aggression or whatever it may be. And I'm sure there's plenty of dudes who look forward all week to a show like that just so they can throw elbows. I think fortunately Matt's genre, the genre periphery genre doesn't cater to that as much. It may be more of like a, like a push mosh dance around whatever, but like in the classic hardcore, there are people, I have friends who do it, who are like, you know, they'll gladly take one to throw one and they like leaving. I mean, a friend of ours came over um, after we were talking about architects that architects um, straight from the path show. And she threw down for straight from the path. 
And um, I think she got a black eye from it. And, you know, and she like, ac- you know, accidentally elbowed someone and he got all pissy with her. And she's like, yeah, but it's a hardcore show. It's like, all right. And I, I see, I see it from both perspectives, but to like Jordan said, to go in there to intentionally try to hurt people to release your aggression that I don't think that's what people should be. Uh, that, that probably wasn't the original intention of the release of these shows. No, those aren't our fans. No, anyway. they're not your fans. You yeah. guys don't have cl- like a classic two-step hardcore dance and throw down. It's it's just jump around and have a good time and enjoy the music. It, it's heavy, but it still is rhythmic, so you can move to it, move with everyone. And I felt that community vibe from the crowd, like to my larger point. And for me, that's what's always attracted me to concerts and even the work I do now. It's creating community through music. It's right. something that everyone there, it could be a thousand strangers, but everyone's there because they love periphery. Mm-hmm. And so it's really easy to connect with strangers in that way. And that's the power of music and a live music experience. That's why we do the VIPs that we do, like the meet and greets, the way we do. We all spread out along the room in different places as far as band members go. And then we just kind of invite people to just mingle, just come talk, talk to us. And you know, I can I can't really speak for the other guys because I'm never around for their conversations, but I always try to create a group conversation. Like I'll maybe start talking to one person who comes over, but then someone else will come over and I'll say, Hey, what's up? What do you do? You know, and get them talking and I'll just create this sort of connection between them so that when we leave after the meet and greet's over, there might be somebody at the concert who came by themselves. And now all of a sudden they have two, three, five, ten other people they can hang out with and connect with, like you were saying. That's great. And I think our fans are very open to that. They're all, you know, from what I know about our fans, they want to see us perform. They want to see us play the songs. They want, you know, they, they want to have a good time. They want to see the goofiness that we bring to the, the stage, which is totally um, pretty it's there. relevant it's there. And, and there. Yeah. Uh, you know, so they're, they're there to have fun. They're not there to start a fight, right. you know, or be aggressive, you know. I think in that can tie easily into what we wanted to talk about today about starting a community and having a community of people getting together. Like Let's, chocolate croissants? Like chocolate croissants for some to? common cause. And it may not be completely defined yet, but I think we're, we're on the road, the path there for sure. I think what's interesting is that we've recorded four of these prior to releasing them or publishing them. And then as soon as Matt went on tour, we, we started with you know the first episode and now over the course of a month, we'll be releasing this. So this is the first time that we've all gotten together since our stuff has become public and we've started to create a community of hundreds of people in a Facebook group and seeing the frequency that it's being downloaded and listened to and even getting private messages and emails about uh, thoughts and feedback and even inspiration already that Mm -hmm. this has kind of stirred within people, which is cool. But now we can actually debrief and talk about like, hey, this is a real living thing and it's evolving and we can start to see a shape or a form of what the potential of it could be. I think this is actually great to do. Um, The people that are currently in the group that are talking about, I'm about to start something new. I've got this new adventure or this new venture I'm taking on. Um, I have an idea. I'm not really sure how to go from the idea into the implementation phase or how to actually make it something that's not viable and tangible. And we could always talk about and rest on, oh, Jordan with Beatwell or Matt with Periphery or something else, me with training or, or a guitar company. But all of that has maybe you know started, we planted the seeds for that so many years ago. And it's harder to explain that to people. Hey, I planted the seeds, I watered them, they grew, but it it took years. We had to keep nurturing, et cetera, et cetera. This is right here, right now. It started a couple weeks ago. Yes, we did some legwork. We did some trial and error to finally get to this point, but you can follow the journey right now and watch it as it grows. And hopefully uh, we can provide some some form of blueprint of this is how you do it. You got to you don't just come up with an idea and then go from 0 to 100. You have to say, "Okay, I've got a great idea. Let me figure out a way to check through to be thorough enough that I can release this and move forward." Yeah, we took our time. We filmed we filmed and recorded what two or three 
podcast episodes prior to releasing episode one. Because, and the reason we didn't release those was because we didn't feel right about it. And that's that apprehension that I think a lot of people will sort of come to have to come to terms with when they're starting something fresh. Because there's this difference between being afraid to actually go from zero to one and try something, and then also being particular about what you put out there. Because I think there's a fine balance. At some point, you have to say, fuck it put whatever you did out there and hope that it gets received well in a way that you don't feel like a jackass or something like that, which I'd always do. But I think you have to be, you have to figure out the clear definition for you or the people you're working with of, of what is good enough. Well, what is because, the baseline, right? What, sure, what, is, yeah, what is the baseline? Yeah, yeah, something that you have to get, you have to get to some form of level. And with podcasts, from what I've come to understand from people that I've spoken to who listen to tons, people who conduct their own podcasts, everybody starts rough. You know, not you don't always know, especially in a group, when to talk and when to shut up. You don't always know how you're gonna, you know, indicate to one another, hey, I'm gonna raise my hand to speak now and and so forth. Uh, there's tons of things that, you know, having microphones that were not really up to par necessarily when starting out. That's all okay, you know. Um but but yeah, the, the point is there's this big difference between a strong sense of self-doubt and discouragement versus making sure that what you do put out there is at least, as I said, it, it's it's reaching that bar of that baseline so that you have room to grow. It's never going to be perfect. If we, we could be doing this for a year and it's never going to be perfect. Well, yeah, practice makes progress, you know, not perfection because what's perfection is an intangible. Yeah. I don't know what perfect is, right? But okay, so but we I, just saw, we just saw, well, real quick, we yeah, just yeah. saw Richard Gross, who's one of our members of the chocolate croissant community. You may have wanted to mention this, but I yeah, think it's, yeah, he I think talks about the fear of getting something started. Well, he was saying that he, he wants to be, he's a student, he's, Richard's a student of mine, a right. drum student of mine. And um, great guy, really, really nice dude. He's facing the prospect of taking on a student of his own for drumming. And he's basically saying in the video that he posted, part of him is like, you're crazy. Why would you do that? You're not a teacher. You don't know how to teach. You're not going to be good at that. The other part of him is saying, well, maybe I can do it. And maybe I can form a stronger personal relationship and maybe I can help somebody. And the, the, the best reason to do anything to go from zero to one and actually risk it is the fact that you do have a chance to help at least one other person improve or have a good experience, anything like that. That's enough to push it over the edge, I think. So for him in particular, you know, Rich, if you're listening to this, you should just go for it and try it. And you know enough about drumming and about taking lessons from people like myself and others of how to conduct yourself. And just like we're figuring out how to conduct this podcast, he'll figure out how to be a good teacher. You just have to be willing to sort of ride by the seat of your pants for a minute. Yeah, fumble and like, through it. You'll get yeah, there. Yeah, you, you fake it till you make it. It all takes time. Yes. And we can also be honest. So it's not like we're trying to pretend to be professional podcasters, right? So we can be honest. That's what we're doing, talking about the process now. So I remember the first time I gave a drum lesson and it was easier because it was with a cousin. So I didn't have so much pressure as far as some stranger would be paying me money and things was, like that. Who was the first? Brady. Ah, yes. Ooh, and he was good. Yeah, he was a great student. Or he ended up being good. Yeah. It's cool. And, but I could also be honest and say, hey, this is my first time teaching. So just like it is a new experience for you to be taking a lesson, it's new for me too. And that's fine. And if anything that creates some sort of like connection or intimacy of the teacher isn't this like person on a pedestal. It's just another human being. So I just think being honest with ourselves, being humble and not to the earlier point, uh, expecting perfection because that's only going to create uh, just a false sense of uh, some sort of outcome. Sure. And then you'll always just do what's safe. Yeah. Or just, not do anything. Mm -hmm. And that's the balance that we're talking about. It's when do we know it's time to start uh, versus, I mean, that's really what it is. When do we know it's time to start? And, and the balance that we're kind of pulling between is we want to have some level of competency and confidence and professionalism in, like with this, releasing episode one. But we have to be flexible enough to say, 
well, at some point we just got to fucking do it. But it, it's, I think you have to find the balance between caring and not caring because the not the, the caring part is going to be the people who you think are going to judge you, how it's going to be received. If you have a good connection, friends like, you know, our current little circle here, it's easy for us to say, Hey, one of us can say, I have a great idea. Let me bounce this idea off you. And you guys will give criticism, constructive criticism, or if it's just really bad, somebody will just straight up say like, this just doesn't work. Right. Um, but then on the other side, it's the, you know, caring part of like, you, you got to put enough into this to make sure that you get it to, cause you can't just say, Oh, I don't give a fuck. I'm just going to do whatever you got to care enough to get it to that baseline. I think that goes back to this important point, which is, you know, you, you will care about what other people think about you much less if you believe that by doing it, you can actually affect someone else positively. It's kind of what I was saying before. Yeah. Care less about 10 people that might think what you're doing is stupid. Care more about the one person that if you don't do this, actually you're kind of doing them a disservice, mm-hmm. right? And especially if it's coming from an authentic place, if, you, if you're using you know, your true voice or the using your true passion, whatever that is, like you want to be a famous drummer. Okay. Why? Or you want to be um, a writer or you want to have a podcast. I mean, there has to be some authenticity there and something that you want to say or express. But if what you're offering, creating, expressing, saying again is going to help at least one person, then it's worth trying it. And we've seen that we've had multiple people now, luckily write us and tell us, Holy shit. Some of the things you, you talked about in your podcast were extremely relevant and it's helping me and I'm making better decisions because of it. Then it doesn't matter if a thousand people think we're stupid. Mm-hmm. Those five people got some value from this and that's really good. We did a good thing. Yeah. I was honestly blown away. So the first time we really made a Facebook um, thread where we're really seeking uh, engagement uh, I talked about morning routines or morning rituals and kind of throwing out, this is what works for me on most mornings and what works for you if you have one. And if not, are you interested in one? So it's kind of like just throwing stuff into the air and seeing what happens. I had no idea. And literally within seconds, people from different countries are writing multiple paragraphs in response. Mm-hmm. And for me, that was the holy shit moment of, okay, this is a thing and we're adding value. It's resonating with, with people. And so for me, it's like now, it, it's, to your point, it's not about us. We're in service of others. And because of that, we're not going to be so judgmental about ourselves of, is this good enough? I agree. 100%. Uh, yeah, I think a really good skill to have based on all this stuff is, is learning how to filter out those negative people in your life who are just hating on you. Right. Sure. You're going to think about if I do this, a lot of people can probably pinpoint someone they know it's going to be like, why are you doing this? You're an idiot. This is so stupid. What a waste of fucking time. Again, and if if we can, if we can, I was talking with people this morning after working out an intentional community, people get together to work out. And then afterwards we have a brunch and we talked about what are you guys doing for the rest of the day and all those other things. And um, I was asked, I asked the question to a couple of them. I was like, how, how small is your, inner circle of people. And they're like, it's really small. And I understand how it would get that small because you want those people that you have that great relationship with who you could take an idea, a business idea, a podcast idea, drum lesson idea, whatever it may be, and you can get the real feedback, not what some other social, you know, societal norm is probably feeding them to give you that answer of like, well, you shouldn't do this. I So two things to say to your first point, this is like what I've been thinking about in the past two minutes is the summary of sort of who you should care about and who you shouldn't Mm -hmm. don't care about the people that are going to bring you down. Fuck it. You should change that to caring about the people you can help. Okay. So don't waste your energy worrying about what people are going to think of you in a negative standpoint, worry about who you can actually provide value to who you can help. Right. Um, And then go ahead. If you want to say something. Yeah. So, cause you, kind of brought in what most of us would consider like a troll, someone who's just being negative for the sake right. of being negative. Right. And for me, what came to mind, one, we all kind of know the idea that uh, 
when you get those that feedback from people, it's obviously more of a reflection of who they are and has nothing to do with really you. Um, but for me, uh, the first time I got very pointed, directed criticism uh, that wasn't meant to be constructive towards me, but just was meant to be kind of an attack. Uh, it was right after a Beatwell gig that I did at a drum and rhythm festival. And I was so happy to get that because the, and, and again, to Matt's point, it's like identifying whose opinion is credible for you. And the way that this woman approached me, she clearly didn't, she didn't have credibility for me. Now, of course, I'm going to be open and listen to her feedback, but that doesn't mean I'm going to take it personally or even validate it. But the fact that she had so much heat towards me made me so pumped because it's like, if I'm making her feel that much, imagine all of the hundreds more that I'm also making feel that much in a positive way. Right. And yeah, you're going to stir the pot. Always. And, and no matter what you do, I think a lot of people end up getting in trouble because you try to please everyone, whether you just have a business and you're trying to attract every customer. Well, then what happens is that you end up pleasing no one because you're not remarkable, you're not memorable, and you kind of soften all the edges that make you or your brand, you know, unique. I definitely thought you were going somewhere else with that. I thought you were going to say, and I loved it because. I knew if she hates me, then I'm doing it the right thing or something like that. But that's basically what he said. I mean, said. Essentially, yeah. essentially, yeah, yeah. Like, I mean, if, if you get haters like that, enough that come with so much animosity against you for no reason, you must be doing something for someone on the extreme opposite end of that. Absolutely. Which is great. And I know that based on all the feedback I got from the other people right after the same workshop that I shared. Crazy. Um, but yeah, for me, I don't know what it was. I think there's a part of me that there clearly is a part of me that likes pushing boundaries in what can be done in even like the field that I work in. It's a very professional field of counseling and psychology. So I like being the one to kind of push buttons and boundaries because I feel like so many of us uh, conform in ways that aren't necessary mm -hmm. and, and uh, even more so conform in a way that ends up muting aspects of who we are. And sure. that's heartbreaking. To me, that's heartbreaking. So for me, I get a rise out of, uh, I don't know if pushing buttons is, is the right way to, to word it, but, but at least um, stretching uh, what, what could be deemed acceptable. Mm -hmm. But still, the point is, I'm there to lead with love and add value. Sure. And there's something that is authentic that you believe in in order to, to be able to take that stance. And when I think back to when we really first started dabbling in this world of, well, now it's podcasting, but just of communicating and talking about feelings and things that were going on, that was at a time when I was feeling some things, but I didn't think that the, that the time and the method of delivery was authentic. So I was on Snapchat a bunch around that time. This is like, what, over a year ago? About. I was yeah, I was on Snapchat a bunch that time, ranting about things at different points of my day, positively, but just putting out my feelings on on certain topics, talking about uh, some of the things we've actually already discussed on the podcast. But it didn't feel right to me, and I that was one of those moments where I was like, okay, am I like just experiencing? self doubt because I feel like I don't want to do this. I would go to record, I actually have like videos saved on my Snapchat that I never released mm. like rants about certain things. And I didn't release them just because deep down it didn't feel like the right delivery method. I, I asked myself like, is this how I want to present myself? Do I want to be like a, for lack of better word, like thought leader personality or like, guru and i and i because when i see certain people do it it comes off disingenuous mm -hmm. and i just felt like that's i don't know i didn't feel like i could keep going with that however fast forward now the podcast feels like a much more authentic setting as well as much more authentic content because 
where I am most effective and I feel it is with my close circle is, is with the people that I work with and that I'm friends with and I love because we have real conversations where we go below the surface and you'll come to me with something and you'll say, Hey, I'm sort of struggling with this or I'm thinking about this. And because I have this vested interest in you, I'm going to, I'm going to ask questions and we're going to have a conversation and we're going to talk about it. And I think what comes out of that is the the best stuff. It's authentic because it's not just like, here's what I think it, you know, you because be. you're talking to a phone. So who are you really talking to? Well, right. And it's not that I don't care about whoever is paying attention. I think that's what I'm saying. I, I really care about who's paying attention and I would rather the information that's coming out be something that is debatable or that is sort of withered down to the, the the gold nuggets of it through a real conversation than just me being like, hey guys, grind really hard today. Right. I've actually, I've been seeing that more recently on my Instagram feed of people just get out there, uh, they just, they get on uh, and and it just goes into a, oh, get out there today, be the best you, you can be, go out there and smash it. You got to kill it even though you might be tired, you might be down, you got to go out, get to the gym, do all your stuff. And I look at that and I just like, I'm like, man, I'm so ready to unfollow you. And people who do that, I feel like they're just talking and they're doing it for for their own invested, their own invested interest. It has not as much to do. It doesn't feel genuine. It feels disingenuous as you guys were saying. It feels like it's a popularity contest. It's like, it does. And, and a lot of a big part of me thinks that it is a popularity contest. I think Instagram and Snapchat leaves you feeling a bit more empty. I think if you do a YouTube channel, which people have gotten away from, I think personally, when I'm the people that I'm following, I think people have gotten more away. Uh, they've gotten away from YouTube because it's more time consuming. I watch people do a video, but they don't post a 15 second clip. They post a 25 minute clip. And for that, you have to put a lot of effort into that. You have to, you can either just throw stuff together and it can be good enough if that's your definition, or your good enough means you have to spend the next three hours editing footage in iMovie or Final Cut to put out a product that you're actually happy with. And you can feel where both, they could go either way. It could be disingenuous or, gen, or, or more genuine, but the people that I follow when they put out stuff on YouTube, I'm like, well, I'm following this because it's genuine and you can tell their excitement, genuine excitement for what they're doing. I think that's generalizing. And the reason why I'd argue your point, one, it's all dependent on the person using the technology. Agreed. But someone could be just have some inflated ego and talk for 25 minutes on YouTube as well and then go overboard in that sense. Well, again, having your own filter to figure out what resonates with you is everything. Right. And, and, and for some people that for us, we could look at and be like, you know, this dude's full of shit or what a douchebag or this person is just interested in uh, something more selfish and ego driven. They may attract a bunch of people that find value in them too. And then who's sure. to say what's valuable or what's not? Absolutely. I, again, then it comes back to a personal preference. Does this work for you? Maybe, maybe not. And at, for Matt's point, if you don't feel it and you're still putting it out there, who are you kidding? At the end of the day, it's not worth worrying about anybody else's shit because the people that are putting up those short five second, 10 second videos, eventually if it's not real, they'll, they'll burn out on it and they'll get back into their own lives and whatever. At least they tried to do something. Maybe they felt that inspiration from others. They're trying to put it out there. I'm not saying that I enjoy looking at it necessarily, but you know, good for them. That's awesome. But the cream of the crop is going to rise. And that's why we have really successful thought leaders that are out there that are inspiring us too, that we, that we reference on, on a daily basis. So uh, by no means is it wrong to do it. I wonder if people should just consider asking themselves, where am I headed with this? What is my goal? Why do I want to say something for real? Who am I trying to reach? Who am I trying to help? Um, the drum camp that I did earlier this year with Mike Johnson and JP Bavay was all about destinations. So we had a room full of drummers and instead of just being like, Hey, let's play these grooves and you know, patterns and this time signature, it was okay. There's 
six or seven destinations that you can go to be a drummer. You can be, you know, like the session guy, you can be the live performer, you can be the hobbyist who just plays drums and has a full-time gig doing something else. Anyway, we made everybody decide what's your destination, right? Where are you headed with this? And by establishing and figuring out what your goal is, what your priority is, that kind of chops off not only methods of which you could deliver whatever you're working on, but maybe even helps you decide which actual direction to go. And I think that was what I was saying. For me, I asked myself those same questions. Why am I on Snapchat talking? Yes, it did really help people. I got a lot of amazing feedback. And those people now, most of them I know personally are paying attention to this podcast, which is awesome. So it worked in that whatever I said had enough value to keep them coming back. And hopefully we continue that. Um, but again, I just didn't feel like my vessel was correct, you know? So I just, I kind of put it on ice and over the past year, the three of us sort of having these organic conversations separately and together is what made me feel like, okay, maybe just recording our conversations and sharing them with people could be beneficial because we're touching on those same emotions and same feelings and so forth, but it felt like the right vessel. This feels like the right vessel. One more point. Please. That being all this being said, I guarantee you there are tons of people out there who are watching us right now. They're like douchebags. They're only going to last, you know, four episodes, five episodes. You know, maybe they're right. Maybe we'll feel like, you know, in five more episodes that we're really not into this and it feels disingenuous to us and nobody's giving us positive feedback and okay, fine. But I feel good about it. I want to keep it going. I think there's definitely been value that's been, that's been delivered, but I want to get better at that. And I want to hear from people too, what else we can talk about. If it feels good to you, there's no reason we shouldn't do this. Whoa. What wisdom. So to go back to where you were with the Snapchat videos maybe a year ago or so, Mm -hmm. because that's really where I see the narrative of this project beginning. So to kind of flesh out how that happened, there wasn't this grand plan to do a podcast about what we're talking about, uh, which I love because then it wasn't this premeditated thing of like, we have to make this work and how do we do it? So I remember you and I were talking about you being interested in digging more into personal content around self-improvement and communication and things like that. And I would see you try the things out. And I really liked it. The one video that I remember was something about talking to your parents and maybe never knowing of, you know, like tomorrows are never guaranteed, things like that. So kind of expressing what you want to express now that you have time and the opportunity to do it today while everyone's still here. I thought it was really nice. But then when we talked, you kind of stopped doing it and said something to the effect of it just didn't feel right, whether it was the right way to deliver it, the right time in your life, whatever it may be. Uh, And then months later, to your point, uh, you and I were meeting more frequently as you and Justin were meeting more frequently training. And I remember the one night at, at dinner, I'm asking you, for some feedback on how I can market Beatwell better. And we end up having a nice conversation for like an hour and a half. And by the end of it, we're like, well, we just did a podcast. Because what we're talking about, clearly a lot of others are thinking about, um, but maybe don't have the experience that you and I may have, um, or the ability to communicate it. And as we continued hanging out more and more and having deeper, more personal conversations, I guess that's how this formed. And we realized that we've created some natural um, just community and uh, just a way to relate to each other that we felt could be of value um, to other people. Um, What I think would be interesting to people listening and watching this right now is maybe digging into the ways that we actually produce that, produce this, and how every day... It's like, oh, well, here's a new thing. Here's a new problem. Here's a new option. And and the way that we've figured out how to work together to create it. Because there's a lot that goes into it. Mm-hmm. The biggest thing that glares at me is that I did have a, you know certain doubts throughout this whole process about this. 
But again, most of it was rooted in the delivery and how we were positioning ourselves. And that, as you said, we don't want to be perceived as these experts or like master podcasters and we just know what we're doing. And that's what I really wanted to avoid. And that's what I was worried about. That's why I was apprehensive for some time, even as we got closer to really pulling the trigger. I was like, I don't know. This feels funny in certain ways. You know, again, part of that self doubt. Share some of the specifics. What were you really worried about? And, it was, and when you reflect on that, was it really that big of a deal? <clears throat> well, I think it is a big deal because we don't want, I didn't want us to be regurgitating shit that we hear people say all the time, for one. I also didn't want to be, you know, presenting ourselves as these like thought leaders and gurus because that's not what we are at all. And that's not what we're doing we each have our own individual expertise and skills and passions and we're just friends and brothers who talk and feel comfortable enough to be honest with each other. That's what I wanted it to be. And I I just think it took some time to really think about it and communicate with you guys about the doubts that I was having to figure out the right direction. And we, if you remember our first crack at it was a little too loose, right? It was, it it wasn't, it, it was too far the other spectrum. We needed to find that balance between like really loose. Like we don't give a shit. Don't listen to us because we're just the average Joe instead of I'm a guru and I know everything. I think we really lucked out that while we were figuring it out, we didn't have the right equipment because I almost feel like we would have released some of that, the original material that we recorded, if it had sounded up to par with what we were looking for. And because we initially, we only had one microphone that we set up somewhere in the center of us. And we realized the further you are away from the microphone, obviously the less audible you were, we were trying to project in different ways and that just wasn't working. We were chewing croissants in the microphone. We were, yes. Now I, I hope uh, if you actually watch the video, you can see I'm turning the microphone. Jordan is leaning away from his microphone. I'm making a mess. This is a mess. Yeah, yeah. Jordan may be making a mess on the floor, but I've ripped my chocolate croissant open, just mine for chocolate, which brings me to something interesting that's happening with this as part of what we do in the day to day. We're mining for quotes and we're looking for certain parts of the podcast we want to highlight when we go to present the podcast. And as we started this podcast, maybe the 10, 15 minutes into it, I'm already in my head and I'm trying to get away from that, I'm trying to be more present. I'm mining for quotes as we're doing this. And I'm thinking, oh, that would be a good one to use. Oh, Matt just said something great. Jordan, that was really well said. And I'm trying to go away from that as much as possible and try to just be as present as possible. Well, credit to you for having that self-awareness because there's all types of things that we could be doing or where attention could be. So to your point, as we're producing and publishing these episodes, we realize that we want to keep uh, you know, sharing content throughout the week and, and not just here's an episode on Monday. So part of that is kind of mining our episodes and finding relevant content that we could provide as samples for people to check the episode out. So that, that's just one example of something that we've kind of figured out along the way. And you are living the process of figuring out, is this, as we record it, the best opportunity to do it? Or am I being pulled away from presenting my best self as we're producing the content? Which is how I feel. I feel like I'm, not that I'm being pulled away from presenting my best self, but that I'm being too critical of how we're each presenting ourselves, which is exactly the point we were making before of trying to just be genuine and not disingenuous and trying to be present and be mindful of what we're all saying. And if you're somewhere else, that's obviously going to take a toll on what you're presenting. Yes, it will. But <clears throat> it's part of the process of figuring out the the right way to do things. It's not like there's this handbook of every single step you should take and every single thing you should do when producing a podcast and finding content to promote it. There isn't. No, the and we have to and figure that out. super new. And to be honest, I wouldn't want to do that. I wouldn't want to use a manual. I want to, I, I want us to figure this out ourselves. The funny thing for me, and there's a lot of people that actually know me personally who know this, who, who have made comments to me about this, 
since we launched the podcast are like, oh, so you're into podcast now? Because I've never been into podcasts and I kind of didn't want to be necessarily, even when we started this, I wanted to approach this from kind of an ignorant standpoint of like, I don't know how people are supposed to really talk during podcasts. I don't even know what we're supposed to talk about, but let's figure it out ourselves and develop our own method, our own brand, our own you know tone of conversation. What you're going through is what everybody goes through all of us on in every step of any endeavor that we that we take on like that because there's constant decisions to be made and it's down to like little things like you sent a picture of a you know a picture um, of me holding up that book or that my journal um, for the what do you want to do with your life post and we debated about where to put the placement of the the website, website. URL you know for a good bit and. These are constant personal and group decisions that we just have to make now. And if we go back to the beginning of this, there was all these different crossroads that that we hit separately and as a group that we had to really decide upon that led us to this point. So I don't know if we want to talk about them specifically, but getting back to where we were with not having good gear, you know, we we did need to have a little sit down and say, okay, are we just going to put this out there or no? And I personally, I remember telling you guys that I didn't feel good about the content. I didn't feel good about the way it sounded. I don't really feel good about that piece of croissant you got in your eyebrow right now, (laughs) right there. Um, I mean, you have croissant here. I know. I'm sure I do. (laughs) But it's on your face. (laughs) It's all good. I mean, um, yeah. You see what I'm saying? Croissants Uh, are rough to eat while you're doing work. let 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 me say one thing. This is important. Okay. Lucky enough for us, we have each other to bounce our our indecision off of. We can say, you know what, guys, that first podcast we did, I'm really not liking it. I don't want to release it. There's too much dead air. There's too much hiss going on from using crappy gear. I'm not into it. Now, you guys are good partners in that you listened to what I had to say, and then you said, okay, you're right. We agree with you on this one. Let's not put it out. What is the problem? The problem is really the gear. We knew we would have to adjust the way we speak and adjust the way we, you know, talk and the things we're doing. We're still going to do that. But the gear was like the one like solvable, tangible issue that we could take care of. And we were proactive about it. And that was great. The thing that a lot of people don't have is somebody to bounce their idea off of. And we talked about this a little bit when we were discussing the what do I do with my life conversation. You know, I, I I could easily say, just use this group to bounce your ideas off things, but that's not where I'm going with this. Although it is a thought because again, I have the in same my mind, well, yeah. in my mind, while we're doing this stuff, I'm always thinking about how can we promote this? How can we share this further? How can we get people more engaged and more involved? So of course there's that opportunity, but I, I, I guess my point is I don't really have an answer necessarily, but I feel for people that don't have that soundboard to bounce things off of and that are and that end up being stuck at that crossroads by themselves and not knowing which direction to go. Draw from your own experience for, for a minute. Go back five years, 10 years. Think about when you decided professional drummer. Think about when you decided at some point over the last three to five years, whenever it was, doing a clothing line. Those were endeavors you were probably doing on your own. You don't really have business partners per se. Now you are running businesses with more partners. But then when you didn't have other members like in this to bounce ideas off of, what did you do? I would write things down, make a list of pros and cons usually. So, But I've also been lucky enough to have good, excuse me, good people around me that I can talk to and bounce ideas off of. I've been in the band since 2009. And the guys in the band with me are great people to bounce things off of. So I, I don't think I'm actually a really good example of this because one, as I've already sort of already, ex, you know, expressed in other episodes, I'm sort of like, I don't worry about risk very much with taking big jumps. Like I, I like to do that. I, I love the feeling of risking something like that. So I can make a, a decision quickly. The thing I can't decide about is like where to eat. Well, I think right. it's I think it's good you can make a big decision easily because Jordan and I, and I know this for a fact, both of us, we struggle with making big decisions 
easy. Little we, decisions we, for me are like trivial well, and I don't know what to do, but big decisions, it's always very clear. Like I'm either going to do this or I'm not. And I really just listen to my gut. And I think that's the answer. We can talk probably on a whole 10 episodes about ways and experiences when we've listened to our gut. But I think you just have to sort of, you got to look inside and do what feels the best. You can have a crossroads where one direction is like, makes you feel kind of nervous, like you got to go to the bathroom. And then you can have one direction that's just like terrifying, right? In that case, I would go with the one that's fucking terrifying. That's because you like horror. Well, no, it's because if something truly is getting under my skin and there's a reason for it, it's like you were saying, you like to sort of shock people sometimes and, and, you know, be a little bit rough around the edges because it creates more, uh, maybe controversies or ask our president. He'll tell you, but But, not even, I, 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 uh it's not trying to be controversial. It's more about trying to make people feel. So it's, it's making people, making people feel something. Right. People though need to figure out how to feel those things personally. Exactly. And that's the whole game. So I've been, I've been doing a lot of work, especially over the past year where I've actively been creating more consciousness about just my body and my emotions. And for you, it seems like it's maybe been a bit more natural for you to really pay attention and more importantly, honor and respect gut feelings. I mean, everyone kind of knows what that is, but not everyone is really able to have direct access and say yes to it. So for me, I've been going through a process of really getting more in touch with not only those feelings, but being able to trust them. I know for me, there is a lot of decisions I've made in my life where I necessarily didn't trust myself and have my own support system within myself. Again, it goes back to the relationship that we create, cultivate with ourselves. And I know for me, uh, there was a, a mistrust within myself, which maybe to Justin's point has made it harder for me to say yes to big things. That doesn't mean that we haven't been able to do that for other things. We've been in bands successfully and taken risks in that way. Me creating Beatwell. I mean, that was one of the biggest risks I ever took in my life in the sense that I really dedicated all of my time in graduate school to this thing. Mm -hmm. But at least for me, I had such conviction that it was possible if I was willing to work really hard. But also a lot of it was me saying yes to the musician within me and not wanting to graduate and just go get like a counseling job. So that was a big motivator for me. It was almost it was almost avoiding something that would have been more painful. And that motivated me instead of uh, really me just saying this is what I want to do. And that's something that like is vulnerable for me to share publicly. But at least for me, it's just being real with myself first and foremost. Mm-hmm. That those are the it's funny. It makes me think of two kinds of people. It makes me think of people that are in some ways more like you who you don't necessarily trust the decision process that, that you're going through by yourself and you, whether it's self doubt or whatever, you don't really wear your feelings on your sleeve, right? More of a poker face at all times. Whereas you want to give off the, this feeling of confidence and control, but in reality inside you're thinking about, is this right? I don't know. Right. But really I think I tricked myself. So because you're saying giving off this poker face, but I think it's really deeper than that as I've done personal work and realizing that I'm doing the poker face to myself. So I'm not even aware of what I'm really feeling. And I've learned to contain my energy. And so as I'm talking about through years of therapy and, and also kind of doing this more body emotional type work with my friend Boris, he, I'm, waking up to the truth within me Mm -hmm. and learning to trust it, learning to honor and respect it. And, and now really integrating in a more authentic, true way, 
Well, you're not bullshitting yourself. Is, is, exactly. Is that, but, you, but you're also aware of it, which, which brings me to the next point, which is I'm the kind of person that always wears my mood on my sleeve. You know when I'm in a good mood or bad mood. So does everybody around me. And that's, I'm very expressive in that way. And that's a good thing. I think being an expressive person is fantastic for this kind of stuff. The thing that's hard to develop is the self-awareness and the ability to sort of, in your head, remove yourself from the emotion and remove yourself from the 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 moment and take a step back and say, is the way that I'm feeling right now, the way that I'm acting, the decision I have to make, what's the why? And what's the, is this right? And I, I guess my point is, that's why I think for me, um, I am able to sort of take steps to, to, to move towards something and go from zero to one. Because I, I know how to, I feel and I express my emotions. I guess the other point is I had to figure out how to express my emotions in a way that was better for others around me. Right. Right. Because it would drag people down or if I were in a bad mood, everybody around me is going to be in a bad mood because I'm going to make sure they are because I want everybody to feel what I'm feeling. And if I'm in a good mood, it's the same thing. I know how to identify those things in myself for decisions like this. What I didn't know how to do was how to control it so that it wasn't very, uh, you know, electric in terms of affecting other people. And what's interesting is that I'm almost the opposite in that throughout my life, I learned to please other people. So I would uh, constrict or mute my feelings in order to not rock the boat with other people. So we're, we're pretty much opposites in that way. And I think the takeaway from it is that there's no right or wrong. There's no black or white. We all are who we are, but what we do all have in common is that we all have our own personal responsibility to become self-aware uh, with respect to ourselves, in my case, and with respect to others, in your case, and make the necessary changes in order to both be the best versions of ourselves, but also be able to have the best relationships with people that we care about. Mm -hmm. Where the fuck did you go? To pee. Yes. Yes. First time. First timer, guys. I have a question. For someone who has spent years overriding the thoughts, what do you do? And you're conscious that you're overriding Overriding those thoughts. what thoughts? So for me, I dealt a lot with um, the ups and downs of eating, food issues. Something where when... I would have a show come when we were growing up, we would play shows. Let's say we, were, we had two, three shows on a weekend, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. I would be very rigid with what I was eating that whole week and how I was exercising. And then when the show day would come, a lot of times I would eat maybe a snack or maybe just not eat at all. And then I would expect that I'm going to look like my best self doing this. Little did I know, I was overriding signals that were going on internally that were telling me the chemical gets released. Oh, you're hungry. And then I would pretty much ignore those and fast. And then after I would play those shows, then I would let my hair down and eat whatever I wanted. And usually that would also then turn into some form of binge and never in... I never remember anything getting so bad that it was like, I mean, just out of control, out of control. But I remember it, they, they, were, it was, they were bad enough. And obviously that's a very subjective um, idea to, to wrap your head around. And so fast forward now, let's say 10, 12, 15 years later, I still have, it's a different set of issues now. It's more the issues of, of the personal trainer or the, or the, um, the, the competitor. And it's almost like I want to look a certain way at the same time as compete a certain way. And as a student of nutrition dietetics, I feel like I also have to look a certain way for that. But I, and, and in this conversation, it's good because I'm, I'm being more mindful of, yeah, but looking a certain way or doing a certain thing is not going to that reflection doesn't mean how many people you can actually help through this stuff. But just getting down with the idea of, from a, psych, from a psychological standpoint, your field, 
when you override signals for so long, even though you're conscious of it, what's the first step in reversing that so that it becomes committed? And I like how you say you don't have to be so fucking rigid. It's like if you mess up, okay, get you know, you you get back on track the next day. But what what is the plan for someone who myself or for anyone else listening who, and I'm sure we've all dealt with something like this, you've ignored or you've downplayed or you've put down for so long those feelings. What do you do to get back to even maybe like to, to like a, a neutral or like back to zero so you can go start going in, in the right direction? So I think the, the universal answer to a lot of the things you touched on uh, deal with feelings and actually feeling the feelings. Okay. So for instance, you're saying with your field, you want to have a certain aesthetic to present to the public. But I would ask myself more based on the the diet and based on the workout regimen, how do you feel? More so than how do you look? So to to the other point about uh, maybe in the past when you had shows and you said you would maybe feel signals or notice signals, which is I think the gut feelings that we were talking about earlier, but yet you, whatever you had this resistance or fear or self-criticism, you wanted to look a certain way and present in a certain way. I think if you're able to one, start to increase uh, consciousness about the feelings and uh, my advice for doing that, and this is what I've learned and use is starting just to get more curious. Okay, so it's just getting curious. And by getting curious, it's a gentler way to start uh, expanding awareness of self Mm -hmm. or expanding consciousness. Um, But it's just getting more curious. And once you start feeling maybe the signal in your gut, actually allowing yourself to feel the discomfort. Because when we make these decisions, whether it's to not eat that, piece of food that probably would have been healthy to eat because it was lunchtime or whatever it may be to you get this uncomfortable feeling and you put on the TV because you want to like avoid the feeling. We do all these behaviors to avoid uncomfortable feelings. The only way out is through. You got to feel the feelings. So it's like you're hungover. What's the best thing that can happen when you're hungover? You throw up because you let the poison out. Mm -hmm. And the reason we create all of these uh, behaviors that may not be most helpful to us in the long run is to avoid something that feels dangerous or negative or scary. But we're tricking ourselves. And what happens is that you do that for 10 years, and then you do that for 50 years, and you realize that you're like a shell of yourself. Mm-hmm. And so for me, I feel blessed that you know before I turned 30, I really started this conscious path of going inward and learning how to face the scariest parts of myself. And I think that's why so many people don't try something like therapy. And not that everyone needs needs that. And there's other kinds of ways to do a process like that. But it's really uh, feeling what's there that we spend so much energy avoiding. Mm-hmm. Like, I, I just don't, you spend your whole life avoiding your truth how can that be good? Well, you, I, I really like what you said in terms of being curious because that's exactly what I was thinking just in different words. I was going to say, you have to take a step back and ask yourself a series of questions and try to look at it from a bunch of different angles. And to be more specific, I kind of just go down the, the list of who, what, where, why, when, and how. You know, I, if I'm experiencing a dilemma or a feeling or I'm overriding the sensor that's telling me, hey, this is probably something you should or shouldn't do, before I make the decision, I, I try not to be impulsive, first off, right? Don't be impulsive. Don't let your feelings get over, overwhelming and then you go do something to, to you know, to, to mask it or to, to appease it, which could be, as you said, like turning on the TV or something like that. Like, don't do those things. Take a step back for a second feel it as you said, but then ask, why am I feeling this? What's the, what is going to happen if I do a and how, and where will I end up? What's going to happen if I do B and how is it going to happen? And what's the possibility? And if I think about your case scenario, you could be very rational 
with yourself, right? You're, you, it's show day, okay? You know on Saturday is show day and by Wednesday, Thursday, let's just say you start really thinking about that and you start kind of cutting what you eat and you're trying to get in this great shape, right? Okay, you know that that's not right. There's something that- I know it's not even healthy. You Well, that's my point. You know it's not healthy, right? But you would- we're going back a long time. I, I don't think I don't think this is one of your neuroses anymore. No, and I didn't know that then. Okay, but but here's the thing. Way bigger but, picture. But you had a feeling. You didn't feel well. I'm sure there's no way you could have played the show and felt you know fully energetic and you know fully nu- nu- you know nurtured and so forth. I think I honestly felt fine. I really did. I remember playing all those shows and like we were a pretty high energy band who threw down like a hardcore band would throw down. And I don't remember it ever affecting me negatively, but well, it did afterwards though, when but you would, mentally afterwards. And and that could also have just played into but that's the it. high of the, per, of the performance. And then you take that away and it's like, Oh shit. Reality sinks back in. No, you knew that what was happening was that you were fasting and then you were binging and you said that, and that's, that's something that you could have stopped yourself in the process leading up to the show day and asked yourself, okay, here's the last question. If I don't eat before the show and then I do what I know I'm going to do afterwards, which is stuff my face, how am I going to feel then? If you would ask yourself that question, right. likely you would have hopefully felt the weight of that negative feeling to a point where it the other side outweighed, right? What, what the, the, it helped you make the decision that way because what you could have done is just said, All right, I know I'm going to feel this way. I know I'm going to feel terrible. So I don't want to feel that way, but I don't want to go and just eat normally because I'm not ready to let myself just say, fuck it yet. But all right, I'll just eat smaller meals or I'll eat salads yeah. or I'll drink water. It or, sounds like what you do, like you'll have your snack and save the, the dinner for later. I guess my point is there's, it, it's never just black and white. There's right. always middle ground that you can find in any of these decision processes. The problem is that people are impulsive and they don't have the training necessarily or they haven't read or they haven't listened to people talk about taking a step back and not being impulsive and, and just waiting for the second sort of rumbling and wave of decision to, to come to, to a head and then make, make that choice. Okay. And I, I guess that's, that's what I'm encouraging people to do is if you're trying to figure out which way to go, how to start something, if you're repeating behaviors that you know are not healthy, that are bad, and those can be a lot of different things, you know what they are. Everybody does. Everybody has their own things like that. You got to, at some point, ask yourself, Am I going to just accept this and keep doing this for the rest of my life and be miserable to whatever degree I am, like you said, 30, 40, 50 years later? Or are you going to just take five minutes to step back and look at yourself objectively? And you, everybody can do that if you choose to. And then your decision process becomes much easier. What we're talking about is very, very, very hard to do to really get real and to look at, put these things that we struggle with and these uncomfortable feelings that uh, make us do certain things that really don't serve us. Like that, that's, it's hard to do that in, in a, in a true way. So yes, we need to be able to assess ourselves objectively, but I think to that point, we need to do it in a way that we're really respecting and loving ourselves in the process. 100%. You don't want to do this to be hard on yourself. So for instance, uh, about a month ago in my own therapy, uh, we were talking about how I often present in the room. And for whatever reason, uh, I don't have much energy a lot of times in the sessions. And what really, really helped is that my therapist, Joel, he kind of imitated how I often walk into the room. My shoulders were kind of slumped. My head was down and just kind of walked towards the couch. And it was so helpful for me to see that as like a reflection because I didn't even realize that's how I was presenting, even though once I saw it, I was like, oh shit, that is me. But my first reaction was like, oh, fuck him. Like what a pussy. And that's me talking to myself. And and he said, no, Jordan, like, 
have empathy for that part of you, have love and respect for that part of you. There's a reason why in a situation like this, you present as that. But now that you have consciousness and awareness of it, instead of being mean or being critical, have love for that part of you so you can actually integrate and heal and become something better. I've started really thinking about this too in my own life. And it's the feeling of self-gratitude. And and being proud of yourself when you make a good decision or when someone brings to your attention something that you're doing that can be improved upon. It's gratitude. And this, this goes back to communication, right? Just like if we were going to talk about a topic that needed to be discussed, we would establish boundaries and set rules and make sure we're all on the same team. You have to do that with yourself too. A hundred percent. You You can't just, as you said, just hate yourself all the time and say, fuck that guy. He sucks. And you know, I don't like the way I'm standing in here and I don't like the way I'm talking here. You have your whole life to grow and get better. And the only way you're going to is if you have gratitude for those moments, right? Everybody has those moments in their lives that they're extremely embarrassed of that they'll never get back that I, I mean, I can think of three off the top of my head that I don't even want to share, but there's like multiple super embarrassing moments that you're just like, oh my God, I wish I could never have to go through that again. And as much as I could say, what an idiot. Like, and I was like, I was such an idiot in certain scenarios. I say it with a smile because it's like, oh, you goofy bastard. You didn't know any better. Now you do. And it's for the better. And I feel fine. And I, I'm not dwelling on that and I'll never make that mistake again, you know, but that's, that's gotta be the process. Yeah. Because if not, it could be 10 years later or 30 years later, and you're still beating yourself up over a decision that you had made. Where's the value in that? I, 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 don't, I don't see it. Yeah, it's not going to solve the issue. So um, we should wrap. We should. You guys got to go watch the hockey game with your cousin for Din Din. You guys had an amazing, in right outside of Washington, when you played Silver Spring, mm-hmm. still in Maryland, but right outside of Washington, you, you guys, the, the Caps... Went into overtime. Spencer rallied the crowd. Your singer, that was great. I, I missed it both times. The "Let's Go Caps" chant. I wanted to film it. Go Caps, go! Yeah, go Caps, go! And I t- did they say go Caps, go? Or let's go Caps. Go Caps, go! Go Caps, go! Okay, yeah. Fair. And I missed it both times. So, Caps aside, because I really do love hockey and the Caps. I want them to win. Dinden. Dindin. Where do you get this from? Because even when we we're talking about pooping in another episode, you're like plep plep. Oh, Dindin? I don't Didi. know. I want to get Didi. Didi has been sleeping here on the ground. Oh, he's up. It's more rhythmic. D-d-d- well said. It's yeah. more rhythmic. I'll take it, that. I, I, and see, I just, I just, there it is. I thought to myself, why do I say that? Oh, obviously, it's more rhythmic. It's a double stroke. It's a double stroke. Dd. Then that's how I would write it. D D plep plep do do. Um, I know our goal was to sort of talk about the specific process of setting up this podcast. I think we did. I think we were able to at least put the parts out there. Yeah, I hope what people take away from this is that it's not we're, we're not again just a bunch of experts that know what we're doing. We're winging this. We're flying by the seat of our pants to a degree. We're getting better. I hope, and we'd love feedback to know that for sure. But in our lives in general, we're getting better at making decisions for ourselves. We're getting better at finding people that we can trust and that we can listen to if we can't make those decisions on our own. Um, so whether that's, you know, w- whether you're in the situation where you're by yourself and you, you really just have to trust yourself or whether you have a great group of friends around you, there's always, there's always tools out there, right? If you are by yourself, figure out how to be objective, leave your body for a second, look down and say, what do I really want? What am I feeling? Where do I go? If that doesn't work, as Jordan suggested, find a therapist, talk to somebody. It's okay to talk to someone. It's cool right? to talk to someone. I've done it twice in my life. Jordan's done it. My um, my good friend, I have a good friend named Johnny Boucher, who runs a program called Hope for the Day, which is a suicide prevention outreach program. You know, he's always saying, and, and it's a big part of their campaign, which is very true. It's okay to not be okay. So if you're not okay with something, there's plenty of places you can go. In fact, you could even go to hopefortheday.org if you wanted to. And I just, you know, hopefully. And and if you really are are hard pressed and you've got something on you and you're listening to this podcast, 
and you don't feel comfortable with any of those other options, we're here. We are here. You can bring your ideas. There are people currently in the group already in the Facebook group that have talked about how do I go from zero to one with starting and getting these ideas off the ground. And the first person that posted that, I remember the three of us all commented on it and chimed in. And there were five, six, seven, eight other people that also commented giving great feedback as well. And I think that's the start. If you're, if you're, if you allow yourself to be vulnerable enough to put yourself out there, it will come back. It's people will genuinely come back to feed something, something of, of hopefully the, and, and some of it will help you and some of it won't, but, but hope I'm, I'm, there's someone in there. I know in I that group yeah. that will help. I have faith in the group for sure. I have faith that we have some empathetic, good people that are, yes. are willing to sort of lend themselves to that. And I know that's how you guys are. And that was the last point I wanted to make was that if you do have a good group of friends or a good support system, sit down and have the conversation with them. That's not about the specific topic you know that that you're that you're debating or the specific challenge that you're facing before you ever get to that point sit down with your closest people that you know and say hey listen i really want you to be open and honest with me i'm at a point in my life where i'm trying to make big decisions and i'm trying to reach my goals and i'm never going to do it unless i'm self aware unless i'm able to better weigh my options on things i'm able to make quick decisions so if you have people that are willing to be that for you don't just expect them to do that. You have to go and tell them, I need you to be this way. I need you to be constructively criticizing with me. I, it's okay for you to tell me if I'm not good at something because I want to accept it and establish those boundaries. And we've talked about communication, but that's such a huge moment of me saying, you guys, guys, you're my really good friends. Tell me when I'm fucking up. Tell me when I'm doing something wrong. Let me come to you and you weigh in on my decisions What's so cool about it, and not to rant, is that you guys don't judge or say, you should do this. Anytime I've come to either with you with a question or a decision, it's always returned back to me in the form of a question as well. Well, what's the goal? What are you thinking about? Why would you go this way? What happens if you go the other way? Who's involved? Who does it affect? Does it help anybody? Is it selfish? All of these questions are questions that you can find, hopefully, good people to ask you as well. If you don't have those people, ask these questions to yourself and you'll you'll be able to make better decisions and go from zero to one, which and is what love, we're talking love about. yourself. Love yourself. Yeah. Jordan, I mean, I, I feel like uh, more recently since we've been doing this podcast, I like to quote Jordan all the time. And it's great. It's, I mean, it's, yeah, man, it's a total too sweet moment. I too sweet people at the gym. It's great. I used um, to, I used to see a therapist back in the day as a, you know, someone I went to, her name was Wendy. Went to Wendy all the time. And Wendy used to say to me, Every session, she would be like, look, just realize that when you make a decision on something, that hopefully that decision was made as the best decision for that time. And you weighed all the options and you asked all the questions so that once you make the decision, it's done and you never look back at it and dislike yourself or that decision. Because at the time, with all the information you had and gathered and bounced off, that was the best direction. You have to love yourself for making that that decision. I like that. You can dislike the decision, but you don't have to dislike yourself for making the decision. Right? Sure. Yeah, my thought with that was just just making sure you have to make sure you're being mindful. And that's everything. It comes back to just being mindful. Mindful, curious, ask questions. I think those are very closely related and that's the theme. Yeah. You know? Be willing to ask yourself the tough questions. Be willing to, to make sure that you're giving yourself what you need for your happiness, right? Giving yourself the most potential to reach your goals. And if you want to start something, all of this should help. Yeah. And if you want to start something, just fucking do it. We'll support you. Hell yeah. Yes, uh, we will. Thanks for listening, guys. And come join us again next Monday. We will be here and there. I don't know if I'll eat a croissant though again. It's All right, let's mess. go to Dindin so we can make plop plop. All right, guys. See ya.